You're listening to The Corbett Report. CorbettReport.com Oh, how the mighty have fallen, my friends. And yes, General David Petraeus certainly is on his way out of the directorship of the Central Intelligence Agency. And one would have to be particularly tone deaf not to note the irony in the fact that the very same director of the CIA, who just several months ago was bragging about how the CIA was soon going to be able to spy on everyone through their electronic appliances, their smart grid enabled electronic appliances, including their TVs and their toasters, was himself brought down by spying from a government agency. So there is at least the little solace that we can take from this whole Petraeus affair that, at the very least, people uh, might have pause to consider, even people in positions of power or supposed power like Petraeus might have reason to consider what the panopticon is really about and what the all-seeing eye of the surveillance state is really looking at. And, uh, And, well... I imagine there are not many people in power who don't know about that. But yes, tonight we are going to be talking about what's happening with Petraeus, not because of the prurient interest of this story. Quite the contrary, I would like to posit once again tonight that this is absolutely not a sex scandal, as much as it's being portrayed that way. It is, in fact, something of a political mystery at the moment, a uh, a whodunit. And it really goes into all sorts of different aspects of what's happening in, uh, in inside the administration right now, inside the U.S. government, as uh, different factions are obviously vying for leadership and control and directorship of the CIA, etc. So there's a lot up for grabs. There's a lot going on behind this scandal. And anyone who caught my very brief four-minute appearance on RT... Well, earlier today, for those of you stateside, uh, you will know that there is a lot of information to go through on this, and I barely had a chance to open my mouth on RT before the time was up. So tonight we're going to be breaking some of this information down, but I would just like to once again reiterate that this is not a sex scandal, and to all of the people in the blogosphere who are complaining about how prudish it is in this day and age for a uh, an official to be in such hot water over a sex scandal, well, it certainly isn't that. And I think we can tell um, just by the, the, the timing and the nature of this story that, of course, that's not what this is about. If it was just about sex scandals, well, then why didn't why didn't Eisenhower's extramarital affairs bring down the Eisenhower administration? Why didn't JFK's extramarital affairs bring down the JFK administration? Uh, why didn't so many of the other political sex scandals throughout history have no effect, no discernible effect whatsoever on the politician's career? Why did uh, people like David Vitter and others who were implicated in the DC Madam scandal get off scot-free when the DC Madam, Deborah Jean Palfrey, was found hanging dead in her mother's uh, garage shortly, shortly after? After she said she would never commit suicide, and shortly after she said she had the entire client list uh, that she was going to make public if they decided to throw her in jail. Why did that client list uh, never get released, even though it was looked at by ABC News, who deemed it not newsworthy to publish any of the names on that list? Or conversely, why did Elliot Spitzer himself get taken down in a big sex scandal literally hours after penning a Washington Post editorial in which he blew the whistle on the whole subprime mortgage fraud just months before it actually unwound in uh, in 2008 there. Why did that happen? Why did the FBI leak the wiretap information on Spitzer to the New York Times just in time for that, uh, that entire dramatic Spitzer takedown to occur? Again, there's a lot that happens in these types of scandals, and I think we have to be aware that when the directorship of the CIA is at stake, these types of uh, scandals are not just about a sexual affair. They're about, well, the future of the country in many different respects. So tonight we're going to be breaking this down. What is this really about? Who is really behind it? What are the different forces that are jockeying for positions of power right now? What effect does this have on such things as the inquiry into what happened in Benghazi? There is a lot to go through tonight, so I hope you've got your pen and paper ready to take some notes because we're going to go through a lot of information. So on that note, let's take a short break. When we come back, we will continue talking about Operation Betrayus from Benghazi to Brennan. The Corbett Report is brought to you by you. Your support makes The Corbett Report possible. 
Sign up for the subscriber newsletter or purchase a DVD at corbettreport.com slash support. All right, friends, welcome back to the program. Welcome back to Corbett Report Radio. Of course, I'm your host, James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. And on this Monday night edition of the broadcast, we are going through all of the information that's swirling around about this General David Petra- Petraeus affair and all of the uh, the scandal that's brewing from this. And as I, re- as I iterated at the beginning of tonight's show, and I will reiterate now, this is, of course, not about a sex scandal. This is about... Well, a potential breach of uh, information at the very highest level of government, for one thing, uh, let alone all of the other implications of this affair. So let's start breaking down some of the things that are at stake in this story and why it is an important story. Uh, First of all, I think one aspect of this that it's important to look at may seem somewhat trivial compared to all the others, but it is still important to take a look at. And it is gestured to by Glenn Greenwald on his Twitter account. He tweeted out this observation a few days ago when this scandal first started breaking. He said, Petraeus and Paula Broadwell have actually done us all a favor by making manifest what access journalism is all about. And certainly one can uh, very much see the point there that this access journalism is in, if not literally, at least figuratively, and in cases like Paula Broadwell, quite possibly literally, a type of, well, prostitution slash journalism where uh, we certainly get to know the subject in, in more ways than one. And of course, it doesn't have to be literally sexual, although that is uh, the, the metaphor that would be used. But certainly the journalists who, who are in bed with the subjects they're supposedly covering in a supposedly neutral way, well, in this case, it really does make that manifest. And some of the disturbing implications of all of this, of course, come out in the form of the I suppose easy jokes and double entendres and other things that are now being noted about uh, the fact that, for example, Broadwell's biography of General Petraeus was the rather unfortunately named All In, etc., etc. But uh, some of the implications of this are still quite, quite important, I think, for this age of access journalism and these reporters that breathlessly cover the comings and goings and doings of these generals and and people in positions of power, and it does leave you wondering just what type of relationship these people have going on behind the scenes. And so, for example, we could turn to this uh, article from bellnews.com, which uh, goes into some of the uh, some of the disturbing implications of this. Uh, for example, quoting some of Broadwell from uh, her uh, biography of Petraeus. Uh, Broadwell wrote, A few months into my research, General Petraeus who was then leading Central Command, invited me to go for a run with him and his team along the Potomac River during one of his visits to Washington. Paula Broadwell writes in in the biography titled All in the Education of General David Petraeus. I figured I could interview him while we ran. Paula Broadwell explained that after earning varsity letters in cross-country and indoor and outdoor track, she wanted to test him to see if he could keep up with her as she interviewed him. Instead, it became a test for me, she said. As we talked during the run from the Pentagon to the Washington Monument and back, Petraeus progressively increased the pace until the talk turned to heavy breathing and we reached a six-minute-per-mile pace. It was a signature Petraeus move. Promoting the book on The Daily Show with Jon Stewart in January, Paula Broadwell insisted that these mile-long runs together were nothing out of the ordinary. This is a typical mechanism for him to get to know young people, she said. He's done it throughout his life. That was the foundation of our relationship. In another often awkward radio interview in January, host Don Imus said that, her, said that the pair must have obviously liked each other. Paula Broadwell responded, You know, as I said earlier, he has a number of mentees, and that's one thing that's different when you compare him to other senior commanders. But yeah, we had a lot of rapport. I think some of that comes from a common ground of having gone to West Point. Etc., etc. So again, some interesting details leaking out about the specific nature of the affair that they were having and the way that it developed. And it does raise some very important questions about the nature of access journalism and what journalism has really devolved into to a large extent, where we see a lot of these profiles of these different people, these commanders and generals and and pe- people in uh, Washington. And of course, the, these articles are being written by human beings who are engaging with these people in some way and the question always has to be raised what is the nature of that relationship why do these particular reporters and biographers etc get this special access 
what kind of relationships develop from that and how does that color or affect the types of information that these people are then able to report on these people. Again, some very important uh, information there. But of course, the nature and scope of this scandal goes way above just the, uh, the typical types of questions we could ask about access journalism. And it goes uh, to the heart of the story in some ways to talk about what it means for the director of the Central Intelligence Agency to be having an affair in the first place. Uh, there are not only the possibilities, for example, for blackmail. Anyone who finds out about such an affair would presumably have some sort of leverage over the general, assuming he does not want to the information to become public. And uh, there are indications coming out now from sources and friends, etc. So trust them as far as you can throw them. But if they are correct, they, they indicate that Petraeus was hoping he would be able to get away with the affair and end it cleanly and go on with his directorship of the CIA. So in given that, anyone who knew about the affair would at least theoretically have some leverage over him by perhaps threatening to expose the affair. And that uh, obviously creates problems because, of course, whenever anyone has that much power and control over that much classified information and, and secrets that could be used to potentially harm the United States and uh, the people living there, well, that uh, that should be a cause of concern. So, for example, uh, I just take an example. Imagine if, for example, someone in a particularly sensitive position like the directorship of the CIA or whatever position in government uh, was being blackmailed in such a way on uh, something like 9-11. And uh, the people who were perpetrating that were actually able to get access codes to secure government systems, etc., or uh, secure clearances because of that blackmail leverage and then using it on a day like 9-11. So is that where we we have the, uh, the, the possibility of something like the angel is next coded message that was being given to Air Force One? Uh, on the day of 9-11, the implication being that whoever was sending that message actually did know some of the security clearances and did have insider access to, to information that could put Air Force One in jeopardy and thus was a type of coded uh, uh, threat to, to Bush on that day, go along with our agenda or you will be axed too, as Tarpley uh, and others have pointed out. Well, it's it's one possibility, and that's why a sex scandal Involving someone in a very sensitive position is never just about sex. It's about the much, much broader implications of blackmail. And, of course, there's, it goes even deeper than that because it, there is some indication. I'm not sure the status of this. We're going to have to wait for more details to come out. But, of course, there is the indication that Broadwell either accessed, had access to, or attempted to access uh, General Petraeus' email his Gmail account, to be specific, which was a personal account, so presumably not uh, used for any official CIA communications, but uh, but certainly one that, that would have contained a lot of personal information about himself that, again, could be used for blackmail. There's not only the indication that she may have accessed it, and uh, there's also the Im implication that others may have tried to access it. And there has been a story going around about some some parties attempting to access his Gmail, and there's no indication of whether or not that was Broadwell or perhaps someone connected to Broadwell. Again, someone could even have access to information about Broadwell, which could then give them access to Petraeus because of that one-step removal. So again, very, very big implications there. And here's another entirely different disturbing al allegation that's arisen uh, in recent days. This one comes from The Telegraph. And if you'll remember from our Don't Believe the Hype episode last week, you should uh, take The Telegraph reporting with a grain of salt. But, uh, but anyway, this one coming from The Telegraph. Uh, David Petraeus, Paula Broadwell had classified documents on computer. And it says that FBI agents investigating the biographer alleged to have had an affair with General David Petraeus found classified documents on her computer. It has emerged. So this goes into some details of the FBI investigation and the fact that allegedly, supposedly, I'm not seeing this being reported in other places, but at any rate, the Telegraph is claiming that FBI agents are now alleging that Broadwell had classified documents on her computer. That uh, and I, I read somewhere else that both are saying that it didn't. Those documents did not come from Petraeus. He did not give them to her. In other words, but the implication being that she somehow had, had access to those types of documents because of her access to Petraeus. So again, a very very important piece of this puzzle, and of course the implication and the question hanging out there is. 
if she had access to classified documents, then who else would have had access to them through their access to, for example, her herself? Again, an extremely important question. And what types of classified documents? Obviously, we're not being told that at this point, and we likely never will. But still, that's just some of the things that can come out in a scandal like this. And another disturbing part of all of this scandal is the fact that this FBI investigation has allegedly been going on for, at the very least, several weeks. I don't think it's ever exactly been made clear exactly when the FBI investigation started, but the, the the narrative that they're giving out right now is that the FBI was called in to investigate harassing emails that Broadwell was sending to one of Petraeus's other alleged flings, Jill Kelly. And this in this allegation, uh, the the Broadwell was sending threatening emails, and Kelly got the the FBI to investigate. And through that investigation, they found out about the affair with Petraeus. That's the official narrative at this point, at any rate. But now it's coming out that, of all people, Eric Holder, attorney general, knew about this probe, knew about the investigation, knew about the allegations, knew about the potential breach of national security at least two weeks before the scandal became public and did not even bother to inform the White House about it, supposedly. Again, that's the story that they've got, and they're sticking to it at this point, at any rate. So... Again, this is a story that it has the potential to keep blowing up and creating very big waves in Washington, depending on who gets sucked into the black hole vortex and who doesn't. And, of course, those decisions ultimately rest on the people with their hands on the real levers of power behind the scenes, who will go down with this scandal and who will survive. And this could very much determine the course of, a few, of the Obama presidency, who gets into the directorship of the CIA, whether or not Eric Holder goes down, some very, very big questions about who is going to be in these puppet positions no no let no, 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 of course but still powerful positions nonetheless on that note let's take a short break we'll be right back after these messages all right friends welcome back to the broadcast once again this is corbett report radio and tonight we're talking about the general petraeus affair and the fallout from it and what this affair is really about and we've gone over some of the uh, the very disturbing implications of this affair and the ways that it can blow up in current uh, in the current political climate and going forward from here but we've only begun to scratch the surface of this affair because of course it goes to the heart of something that is very very much at the forefront of the CIA's mind at the current uh, time, which is what happened in Benghazi in September 2012. Of course, everyone remembers the attack on the the U.S. consulate in in Benghazi, consulate in quotation marks. What really was that all about? Ambassador Stevens, of course, in fact, being uh, really impl- implicated, or at least the uh, the. Uh, the allegations are that he was implicated in basically gun running for the uh, the, the Syrians uh, b- uh, and overseeing the CIA operations to to steer some of the uh, the Libyan militias guns and arms towards Syria and all of those implications swirling around. But uh, but there was also, of course, the fact that the CIA was heavily involved in what happened in Benghazi, uh, not least of which because they had a CIA annex that was separate from that U.S. compound that was being attacked that night that uh, was attempting to reinforce what was uh, the the consulate that was being attacked and, and t- attempting to get uh, Delta Force reinforcements as well to help both the CIA annex and the consulate. So uh, the CIA had a very important role in the, all of this and the person, of course, in charge of directing all of that and the person who would have had access to all of that information is General Petraeus, who was director of the CIA at the time. But, of course, he has just resigned because of the Petraeus affair scandal. And, lo and behold, now it is his replacement, Michael Morell, who is supposedly set to testify at the congressional inquiry into Benghazi about what the CIA knew, when it knew it, and how it uh, came to know that information. Which is, uh, well, I think unsatisfying. And there's now a lot of GOP senators and others that are starting to talk about how this is absurd, why uh, Petraeus has to testify, because he was the one who was... uh who was heading the agency, he was the one who had this information. So it is extremely important that he is being 
basically uh, elbowed out of these Benghazi hearings, and his testimony is apparently, at this point, not scheduled to be heard. He may still be subpoenaed and brought before the hearings, but uh, we'll see how all of this plays out. But on the issue of the CIA involvement in Benghazi and who knew what, when, and what did they know, and what are they covering up, a potentially interesting clue was leaked by, or perhaps unwittingly leaked, by Paula Broadwell back last month when she was delivering a lecture, and this has now been put on YouTube. It's likely to be taken down. Apparently other copies of it are being taken down. I'll put the link in the show notes, but let's listen to a little clip of this lecture where Paula Broadwell spills some beans on some potentially very interesting information about what the CIA was doing in Benghazi. Let's listen to the clip. Thanks for taking my question. Um, General Petraeus, in his new role, has a very difficult situation now in the center of the situation in Benghazi. Do you have any comment? Well, um, just to create some context for those in the room, um, as you know, the uh, ambassador in Benghazi was killed along with a couple of of security agents who happened to be CIA. Uh, security paramilitary forces uh, that just came out today in in Fox News but um, the challenge has been the fog of war and the greater challenge is that it's political hunting season and so this whole thing has been turned into a very political sort of uh, arena if you will Um, but the facts that came out today were that the ground forces there at the CIA annex which is different from the consulate were requesting reinforcements They they were requesting the it's called the Sinks in Extremist Force, a group of Delta Force operators are very most talented guys we have in the military. They could have they could have come and reinforced the consulate and the CIA annex that were under attack. Now I don't know if a lot of you've heard this, but the CIA annex had actually um, had taken a couple of Libyan militia members prisoner, and and they think that the attack on the consulate was an effort to try to get these prisoners back. So that that's still being vetted. The challenging thing for General Petraeus is that in his new position, he's not allowed to communicate with the press. So he's known all of this. They had correspondence with um, the CIA station chief in in Libya. Uh, Within 24 hours, they kind of knew what was happening. Extremely interesting. Did anyone catch that little tidbit of information that she slipped in there? The the idea that the CIA annex had was de- was holding prisoners, Libyan militia prisoners, and that the attack on the consulate was an effort to free those prisoners that the CIA itself was holding. That is an extremely important allegation, and one that is uh, that the CIA, for one, has taken no time in re- or thoroughly refuting because of its implications, no doubt. CBSnews.com from earlier today, CIA denies it detained militants in Benghazi. It says, quote, the CIA is denying an assertion made by David Petraeus his biographer and girlfriend, that the agency held militants in Libya before the September 11 attack. During a talk last month at the University of Denver, author Paula Broadwell said the CIA had detained people at a secret facility in Benghazi, and the attack on the consulate there was an effort to free those prisoners. President Barack Obama issued an executive order in January 2009, stripping the CIA of its authority to take prisoners. The move means the CIA can no longer operate secret jails across the globe as it had done under the administration of President George W. Bush. CIA spokesman Preston Golson said, Any suggestion that the agency is still in the detention business is uninformed and baseless. Uh Uh-huh. Well, perhaps rather than taking the CIA's word for that, that is something that may come out in the congressional hearings into what happened in Benghazi, but I wouldn't hold my breath on it. All right, let's take another short break. We'll be back with more on Operation Betrayus right after this. All right, friends, welcome back. Welcome back to Corbett Report Radio. Let's continue talking about this Petraeus affair and the various implications of it. Of course, this is not just a sex scandal. This is much, much bigger than that and has the potential to, as I say, truly transform the nature and tenor of the Obama presidency for the next four years. So we have to see what will develop from this. But just as a recap, some of the implications of what we've seen already developing from this scandal include the questions, as always, about access journalism and what these journalists are really uh, getting in return for their scoops and uh, what the people who are 
uh, give, feeding them information are getting in return and how that affects the impartiality of these types of reports and biographies and other things that are made of people in power and whether or not it is always literally a sexual relationship it certainly is at the very least a type of metaphorical betting that the uh, the parties involved get into so that is an open question and something that again needs to be considered in case anyone out there hasn't considered it yet but i assume if you're listening to media like the corbett report you're probably well aware of how the media is manipulated and consists of people who will do anything to get into a positions where they can interview people in power, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So perhaps nothing too surprising there. It's also, of course, about the uh, the blackmail issue and who had access to whatever classified documents that Broadwell allegedly had on her computer and uh, who else had access to his Gmail account or who else attempted to gain access to his Gmail account. What connections did Broadwell have to other people? Was she herself being spied on by presumably other government agencies, other uh, uh, other as, uh, foreign governments? I mean, who knows how deep this goes? And again, that's not something that's likely to ever come out in, in the public, but is something that I have no doubt that assuming there are actual real uh, people in the CIA who really do care about what's going on and are not part of what's going on, I'm sure they would be very much considering those types of possibilities. And of course, we also just looked at the, uh, the some of the implications about what could happen with the Benghazi hearings that are now going on and will presumably still go on. And uh, now instead of General Petraeus giving his testimony about what happened, uh, in Benghazi. Now it's going to be Michael Morell, the former deputy uh, director who is now the acting director of the CIA, is going to step in and basically talk for Petraeus, which has to lead to the question of, well, what did Petraeus know and what would be missed or covered up if he does not testify at these hearings? Now, it must be stressed right now that we don't know yet whether or not Petraeus ultimately will testify at the Benghazi hearings and uh, there's some reports saying that GOP senators are already saying they'll subpoena him if he doesn't appear voluntarily. Uh, voluntarily. Again, this is going to go into Washington Beltway politics, and we'll see what develops of it. But uh, the question of whether or not Petraeus may have been exposed and scandalized to stop him from uh, testifying at these uh, hearings is something that, at the very least, we have to consider. And, of course, that raises the other question of... Who is going to fill his seat? Again, the directorship of the CIA, an extremely important position to hold. In fact, one that probably holds much more power than the presidency itself, as evidenced by the fact that, for example, uh, when they needed a good crony to step in uh, into the directorship of the CIA back in the 70s, when all the scandals were coming out from the church committee hearings, etc., who did they turn to? George W. Bush. That's right. Uh, the man who supposedly had no affiliation and no association with the CIA before he started, uh, before he became their director in 1970, what was it, 1975 or thereabouts, uh, served as director for one year. And uh, supposedly that was all of his entire association with the CIA. And, uh, and lo and behold, now the CIA uh, uh, have a building named after him, etc., etc. I think it's safe to say that Bush was CIA from the 1950s. And again, anyone who's looked into the work of, for example, John Hankey on that issue know the many, many different things that connect Bush to the Zapata oil company and the uh, the operation to overthrow Castro and how that ties into JFK, etc., etc. A lot of history there that's well worth looking into if you haven't yet done so. But the point is that the directorship of the CIA is an extremely important, extremely sensitive position. And if the wrong guy gets into that office and spills the wrong secrets, it could actually have a negative effect on the people who are in the sh shadow government, the secret team, whatever you want to call it, working behind the scenes to puppeteer the government that we see and is supposedly fronted by Obama, who is a puppet of no significance on the big scheme of things. So who will fill the directorship uh, chair at the CIA? It's a very important question. And speculation is already beginning to emerge. For example, the Army Times has uh, piped in with its own idea. Morell may be successor to Petraeus at CIA. And it starts by talking about how Obama will want to avoid uh, a, a, a scandalous type of appointment or something that's going to cause any type of controversy or make any type of waves. So he's 
going to want to go to a safe and easy choice. So he might uh, just appoint Deputy CIA Director uh, Michael Morell as the new director. Uh, he is, as I say, the currently the acting director, but uh, that's only an interim position until the seat gets filled. So uh, currently, uh, it is Michael Morell, and the the Army Times is saying it could he might step in and and become the new director. But interestingly enough, later on in this very same article, it goes on to say, quote, The administration may also be considering John Brennan, the White House's top counterterrorism advisor who has overseen the expanded use of drones and special operation forces against Islamic terrorists. Brennan carries some political baggage that could make Senate confirmation difficult. He withdrew his name from consideration for a top intelligence position in 2008 because of his alleged links to enhanced interrogation techniques while an official at the CIA. So here we have Brennan, and his name has been floated around in several stories. He is at least uh, in the running, I think, to be considered as a potential new director for the CIA, and that opens up an entirely different can of worms. And in some ways, in fact, at least potentially, feeds right back into the whole Benghazi situation. And this is an interesting aspect of, uh, of what's going on right now that starts to get into some very, very interesting, very deep and detailed and, and kind of weird stuff that's going on around this Benghazi uh, affair that, that happened in September. We have this story from the Northeast Intelligence Network, homelandsecurityus.com. Of course, I'll put the link in the show notes so you can go and read it for yourself. It's a very long, very detailed, and very interesting report called Body of Lies from Benghazi to Barak. And it's talking about this Innocence of Muslims video, which was the red herring that the the White House threw out as the reason for this Benghazi attack. Since then, we now know that not only was this nothing to do with what happened in Benghazi, but the White House has known basically from day one that this was nothing to do with what happened in Benghazi. But they threw it out as the red herring, and the media went dutifully chasing that red herring for weeks, talking about this Muslim video. Well, in this report, Douglas J. Hagman starts to go into some of the details of the video, when it was constructed, and more importantly, uh, some of the details about when and how it was posted to YouTube and when it started to get changed. Uh, For example, its title was changed um, a few times during production, but uh, the YouTube video itself that was posted on uh, 1st of July 2012 was changed, uh, the title was changed from The Innocence of Bin Laden to The Innocence of Muslims. Again, that was on July 1st, 2012, the title was changed. And this report goes at least somewhat into the question of who actually made that change to the title of the video. And it points to a very, very interesting report from a YouTube user under the name Montagraph, who has an interesting and detailed video talking about his own research into uh, into the matter about this video, when and how it was posted, the channel that posted the video, etc., etc. A very interesting 20-minute or so video exposing some of the details there. So I will put the link into that video as well so you can go and watch it. But uh, but it, 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 this actually starts to connect into John Brennan, who we just mentioned could become the new director of the CIA. So if reading from this report on HomelandSecurityUS.com, quote, In the Montagraph video, a connection is drawn to Stanley Inc. The importance of this, beyond the status as a defense contractor from Arlington, Virginia, nudge, nudge, wink, wink, lies in the digital fingerprints connecting the video, The Innocence of Muslims, with a user with access to the News Politics Now website. The Montagraph video explains the connection by the presence of a common avatar, or an image used by internet posters. So again, you can go and watch that Montagraph video for more details on that. Basically, the implication is that somehow this News Politics Now channel that posted this Innocence of Muslims video has connections to Stanley Inc. And who is Stanley Inc.? Very good question. Well, for that, let's actually turn to... uh, Uh, HistoryCommons.org, which of course is an invaluable resource on so many different things, especially due to 9-11 and its 9-11 timeline, but on other issues besides. And they have this fascinating entry that again I'll post, of course, in the show notes from March 21st, 2008, a story that I'm sure many people out there have completely forgotten, but it is a fascinating story. Firms of State Department contractors who broke into candidates' passport files 
identified. And this it relates back to the story of a breach of passport files that took place on or that was revealed on March 20th, 2008. So turning back to that entry, uh, on March 20th, 2008, the State Department confirms that three of its contract employees improperly accessed the private passport files of Senator Barack Obama, the leading candidate for the Democratic presidential nomination. Two of the three were fired, and a third was subjected to as-yet-unstated disciplinary procedures. The Obama campaign quickly demands a complete investigation of who accessed the files, who they may have shared the information with, and what their possible motivations may have been. So again, this story breaks at, um, March 20th, and it's a huge, huge scandal at the time, and generates a lot of headlines, as of course it would, a breach by State Department contractors of the passport files, not only of Obama, but also of, of Clinton and McCain. So basically the three main contenders at the time for the presidency, but specifically Obama's records, of course, being particularly contentious and potentially very interesting. So who was accessing this? Well, again, that came out on March 21st, 2008, the next day. Two of the government contractors who improperly accessed Senator Barack Obama's passport records records are revealed to have worked for a Virginia-based firm, Stanley Inc., before being fired. A third, who accessed both Obama's and Senator McCain's records, worked for the Analysis Corporation. Both Obama and McCain are presidential candidates and their files were improperly accessed by contractors working for the State Department. Okay, Stanley Inc., again, that's the story, that, that's the, co the company that we just heard that uh, was potentially connected to this Innocence of Muslims video, and that's, that's interesting in and of itself. But the other firm that was implicated in this scandal, Analysis Inc., and let's read about Analysis Inc. The analysis contractors who accessed Obama's and McCain's files has not yet been fired. That contractor is described as a veteran State Department contractor and an otherwise terrific employee. Analysis is staffed with an array of former intelligence community officials. Its CEO is John Brennan, the former head of the National Counterterrorism Center and a former deputy executive director of the CIA. Okay, so once again, let's just step back and examine the importance of this. John Brennan was CEO, the chief executive officer of Analysis Inc. at the time when one of its star terrific employees illegally accessed the passport records of then Senator Barack Obama. And uh, some very interesting parts about that story and what that actually meant. Again, coming from this HomelandSecurityUS.com article where it uh, talks about the the implications of this, uh, it goes on to say, uh, just a second, uh, it goes on to say, it's important to point out that during the investigation of the breach of the passport office records, the Washington Times reported that officials do not know whether information was improperly copied, altered, or removed from the database during the intrusions. And, wait, it gets even more interesting. Have you never heard of this story, or did you hear about it briefly in March of 2008 and then forget about it? Well, there's a reason why, and that comes from April of 2008, April 19th specifically, when the Washington Times ran a story, Key Witness in Passport Fraud Case, Fatally Shot. A key witness in a federal probe into passport information stolen from the State Department was fatally shot in front of a district church, the Metro Metropolitan Police Department said yesterday. Lieutenant Quarles Harris Jr., 24, who had been cooperating with, a federal, with federal investigators, was found late Thursday night slumped dead inside a car in front of the Judah House Praise Baptist Church in Northeast, said Commander Michael Anzello, head of the department's Criminal Investigations Division. Commander Anzello said a police officer was patrolling the neighborhood when gunshots were heard. Then Lieutenant Harris was found dead inside the vehicle, which investigators would describe only as a blue car. Uh, it gives some more details, and then it goes on to say, A State Department spokeswoman yesterday declined to comment, saying the investigation into the passport fraud is ongoing. The Washington Times reported April 5th that contractors for the State Department had improperly accessed passport information for presidential candidates, Senators Clinton, Barack Obama, and John McCain, which resulted in a series of firings that reached into the agency's top ranks. One agency employee who has not who was not identified in documents filed in U.S. District Court, was implicated in a credit card fraud scheme after Lieutenant Harris told federal authorities he obtained passport information from a co-conspirator who works for the U.S. Department of State. 
So one of the key witnesses, one of the, the important linchpins in the investigation into the stealing and, and pilfering and altering and whatever went on with Obama's passport records found dead just weeks into that investigation. So uh, again, whatever resulted from that investigation, a few firings of a few officials, but no details that I know of have ever been released as to specifically what was copied, altered, altered or removed from Barack Obama's passport records. Although interestingly enough, Again, coming from HomelandSecurityUS.com, on April 8th, 2008, Obama continued to comment on the fact that the confidentiality of his passport records were apparently compromised. It was on this occasion when Obama admitted for the first time in any public venue as a presidential candidate that he traveled to Pakistan in 1981. One wonders whether Obama would have disclosed his Pakistan trip at this time had it not been for the uncertainty that the information was already in play. So some interesting things start to come out on the campaign trail in the wake of this passport records breach, and Obama starts to uh, lift the veil a little bit on some of his uh, past and traveling to Pakistan in 1981, and how that ties into the potential CIA links that Obama has. And again, that's a whole other field of investigation that we'll have to get into on another occasion. But the implication being that once again, the access to the information, either the copying or the altering or the removing of these records either could have been done by, for example, someone connected to a, a firm that was just happened to be headed up by John Brennan, key CIA and counterterrorism official, uh, could have been done either to help cover up some of those records or potentially to use some of those records as blackmail and leverage over Obama. And guess who's slated to potentially be coming in as the next director of the CIA? John Brennan. What a small world after all. All right, we're going to take one final break. We'll be back to try to wrap things up. Again, a ton of information tonight, so we'll be back to, to tie up the loose ends after this. Turn it on. I want my bail out money. Keep the bills coming. Sweet green cash just dripping like honey. I'm a new kind of thug with the Washington buzz. All right, friends, we're back here in the final minutes of tonight's broadcast of Corbett Report Radio. And once again, there is just so much information swirling around about this Petraeus affair and what it really means that, of course, I can't cover it all here and I can only cover the bits and pieces that we can get to. But very, very, very interesting and a lot of information that is still up in the air at this point. So this is necessarily sort of speculative and on the fly, and it really does depend on what pieces of this story emerge and how things move from here. So first of all, let me correct something that I said earlier tonight. I said that uh, Holder, uh, uh, the, uh, the Attorney General, knew about this uh, FBI probe into the Petraeus affair for at least two weeks prior to the scandal breaking publicly. I misspoke. Sorry, it was at least two months. In fact, Holder has known about this uh, this scandal since late summer, but chose not to tell Obama or the White House about it. Uh, pretty interesting, and that should, of course, in any reasonable universe, uh, bring down someone like Holder, who one would suspect would have an obligation to pass on information of that much importance to the White House so that they might be able to, oh, I don't know, potentially plug up a national security leak and or uh, take some action to, to find out more about the matter and or potentially prepare for the resignation of the director of the CIA. Uh, the, the scale of a, uh, a mistake like that is just too incredible to be believed, and I would say we shouldn't believe it. And we'll see what if old Holder can wiggle his way out of this one, as he apparently has over Fast and Furious and all of that. But again, an important aspect to this story. Again, other aspects of this are continuing to emerge, still up in the air, still in question. For example, when precisely did the FBI investigation start? And why was no one in any of the other branches of government told about this or kept informed of, the, of this, except for people like Holder, who didn't pass that information on? Uh, this is just coming up, FBI agents' behavior questioned in probe that turned up Petraeus' affair, and it goes on to talk about how the FBI agent who was investigating the harassing emails to Jill Kelly was himself harassing Jill Kelly. He was sending shirtless photos of himself to Kelly, and so he was, I guess, somehow 
tied up with this woman who herself was part of the investigation into that that turned up all of this uh, just craziness and layer upon layer upon layer of craziness being uncovered even as we speak. So some things that I hope people will keep their eyes on in the coming days and weeks is, for example, whether or not Petraeus will testify at the Benghazi hearings, and if so, what does he say, and how closely do they drill him, or do they stay away from him? Is this a, uh, a message not to go too deeply into what happened in Benghazi? Uh, who gets appointed as director of the CIA? Uh, does Brennan get appointed? And if so, what, what about some of these scandals that are swirling around? The fact that he was CEO of the corporation, who's one of their star employees, broke the law and uh, illegally accessed Obama's passport records. One of the key witnesses in that case gets shot the next month. Um, the, the, the probe goes nowhere and the, the employee who broke that law did, doesn't even get fired. Uh, just some very, very, very big question marks that are swirling out around characters like Brennan and about what's happening right now in this incredibly important transition of uh, CIA leadership. Of course, as the CIA continues to expand what it's doing in its illegal drone strike program and, and the potential for the secret prison program to have been carried on even after Obama's executive order supposedly uh, quashed it. Again, we have to keep our eye on that. I'll be keeping my eye on my side and I will have some updates on this story Thursday night as we go over some more news and open, uh, open phone lines on the program. But uh, I hope you guys will be keeping uh, your eye on it out there. And of course, send me any links that you think are particularly interesting through the contact form on CorbettReport.com. But we will be back 23 hours from now on a completely different topic. So until then, thank you all for listening and take care.